All right, the president plans to send a thousand more troops to the Middle East in an effort to put pressure on Iran. Uh, no, I'm not exactly sure what kind of pressure. My next guest wants to make sure that Congress has a say in any military action against the country. Doesn't want this to spiral out of control. Of course, the Republican Senator, member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, former presidential candidate Rand Paul. Senator, very good to have you. Thanks for having me. Uh, what do you think of this thousand troop commitment? You know, I'm for less troops in the Middle East. I think it's a mistake to keep ramping things up. Uh, one of the things I liked about President Trump is that he said the Iraq war was a mistake. I think an Iran war would be even a bigger mistake than the Iraq war. We lost over 4,000 soldiers over there. I, I don't think we need to uh, get involved in another war. Uh, Iran is really not someone that we depend on for oil. The Middle East, in fact, we don't depend on for oil anymore. And so, uh, no, I think it'd be a mistake to get involved in another shooting war. You know, uh, Senator, your colleague Tom Carton, uh, the Republican of Arkansas, a very close ally with the administration on this, had urged the president to just attack Iran outright, uh, saying that he didn't need permission from Congress. He went on to say that unprovoked attacks on commercial shipping warrant a retaliatory military strike. The president has the authorization, he says, to act to defend American interests. What do you think of that? Well, it's, that would be inconsistent with the Constitution. The Constitution is very clear that we don't go to war unless it's voted on by Congress. A declaration of war is required to be voted on by Congress. Now, if a ship is shooting at you, you can return fire, you can defend yourselves. But to go and retaliate and say, oh, we're going to blow up one of their naval ships or we're going to drop a bomb on Tehran or to say this somehow has to do with the 9-11 proclamation, no, those are completely wrongheaded and unconstitutional ideas. But I think what's interesting about this is that of all the people involved with the administration, I think really the president actually has the best handle on this and is less likely to act in an irrational way to immediately blow something up. I think he actually has pretty good sensibilities that most of the wars that we've fought in the Middle East really haven't been for our national interest. Um, nevertheless, I think, and you can correct me on this, Senator, he is open to uh, military aid or agreements with the Saudis. You have concerns about that. I think people that would chop up a dissident with a bone saw may not be the most trustworthy of people. If we're talking about giving them nuclear technology that they could actually use to break out and pursue nuclear weapons, huge mistake to give a government that actually chops up dissidents, uh, beheads people, crucifies them. These aren't the kind of people that really should have nuclear weapons. But beyond that, even conventional weapons, I'm not for arming them. They've had an acceleration of the bombing of civilians in Yemen, total disregard for civilian life and for the humanitarian disaster that they're causing. So no, I think the Saudis uh, don't deserve our weapons. I think that they, if we are ever to have sell them weapons again, it should be conditioned on better behavior. Um, the acting defense secretary, Patrick Shannon, is not uh, going to complete the confirmation process uh, to be the permanent defense secretary. A number of allegations have come up, uh, domestic violence and others. Uh, the president spoke about this just a few moments ago, Senator, and I, then I want to get your reaction. No, I didn't. I didn't ask him to withdraw, but he walked in this morning. He said it's going to be a rough time for him uh, because of obviously what happened. But I did not ask him to withdraw. He uh, presented me with a letter this morning. That was his uh, that was his decision. What do you think of this whole thing? It's been replaced for the time being by the secretary of the army, Mark Esper. Um, but it, it just hit everyone broadside. You know, I think it would be a good time to re-examine who we want at Department of Defense. Number one, I think it should be someone who agrees with President Trump that the Iraq war was a mistake, that regime change has not worked and has many unintended com consequences. But I also think it would be a good idea to rethink whether or not we want somebody who spent their career in procurements and where profit has been very much uh, motivated by more weapons to everyone. I think we need someone a, more, a little more dispassionate who uh, maybe doesn't get confused with profit and national interest. Do you think we're getting in a little deep in the Middle East? This this situation notwithstanding, and uh, the Secretary of the Army has uh, had a more hawkish tone on these things. Uh, we'll, we'll see what pans out. But you're worried about getting a little deeper in a region that we've been deep in for decades now. 
Yeah, and I think what a lot of people don't get out of this and don't examine this thoughtfully is that Saudi Arabia and the Gulf allies around Saudi Arabia spend eight times more on the military than Iran does. Saudi Arabia is the third biggest purchaser of weapons in the world. So I don't think Saudi Arabia is all of a sudden going to be overrun by Iran if we don't sell more weapons to them. Neither do I think Iran's going to be overrun by Saudi Arabia. I think there's somewhat of a standoff between the two and a counterbalance. But I think just continuing to dump arms into this cauldron is uh, fueling an arms race and particularly nuclear technology. If Saudi Arabia should misuse nuclear technology, Iran will quickly follow if they're not already headed in that way. So if you had three regional powers all within about a couple hundred miles of each other with nuclear weapons, I think that would be the worst disaster we could, any of us could imagine. Senator, switching gears a little bit, the president didn't outright deny a Bloomberg report that was out there that he wanted to demote. Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, there had been talk earlier that he wanted to fire the guy. He's already spoken publicly about how he regrets choosing him in the first place. Uh, but apparently didn't go anywhere. Now he is saying um, that he just uh, says, uh, let's see what he does. Uh, what do you think of the whole back and forth, fire the guy, then can't fire the guy, demote the guy, <laughs> couldn't demote the guy? What, what do you think? You know, I don't really have a comment directly towards any one person at the Fed, but my general comment would be this. The price of money, interest rates, is the most important signal throughout the whole economy. And when the government fixes the price, you get the same distortions you get if you fix the price of bread. If you fix the price of bread, you only distort the bread market, or mostly the bread market and maybe their suppliers. If you fix the price of money, you distort all markets, and we, put, we don't get the feedback to know when we've overbuilt or overextended or entering into a new phase in the, in the business cycle. You can't really determine when the business cycle comes or goes without freely fluctuating interest rates. So I would appoint somebody to the Fed who believes in letting the marketplace work more in the arena of interest rates. So don't lower interest rates? <laughs> I would let the market decide. It's sort of like asking me, would you rather have cheaper bread or more expensive bread? No, you want the market price of bread. And it's the same with interest rates. Well, the market and is kind of imitating what the Fed's doing these days, right? Well, and that's the point is, is that for a long time, really probably almost for a, a two decades, the Fed has sort of led the market and we've been fixing interest rates. But right. a lot of us, a lot of us believe that the housing crisis was spurred because you kept interest rates below the market rate. And there was no feedback to say we built too many houses, among other problems. But that was at least part of the reason we got this huge boom and bust in the housing market. Yeah, and there are zero percent interest rates after that. Um, very good having you, Senator. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Dan.